Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, up now we have Juan Nunez Iglesias uh, telling us about functional programming in Python with ToolZ and FN.py. And uh, before he begins, just a quick mention that we are now live streaming the FP MiniConf. Okay, thanks. So here's one. All right. Um, so that's a tough talk to follow. Um, pretty sure Python is not a total language. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see how we go. Uh, so I should probably re restyle my talk title to functional style programming um, because there are many things that are going to upset some people in the room, I think. Um, OK. Um, so I'm a researcher, and uh, I do scientific programming with life sciences applications. Uh, and I'm mostly self-taught, so um, yeah, a lot of the rigor of functional programming is going to be missing. Um, OK, and some links if you want to snap that. So this is actually an IPython notebook, uh, which you can download and run from that GitHub repository. Um, and if you don't know what that means, that's fine. Like, come to me at lunchtime. Um, OK, um, so what functional programming is in the context of this talk? Um, mostly, it's the idea that if I have a specific input x and I apply a function to it, then I'm gonna, always going to get the same y. Uh, and there's not any global state that's going to mess with me, uh, which happens all too often. Um, and also that functions are first class objects. Uh, so um, yeah, I can have a function like map, which applies every, to every element of x, applies that f. Um, so Python um, is OK with the first thing. Um, and uh, it, it has the second thing for free. So that's, that's really nice. Um, and the other thing that Python does is um, through the yield keyword, you can have lazy evaluation of sequences. Um, so that's something that you can do in Python. Uh, even if the enormous sequence doesn't actually fit in your memory. Uh, on to what it's not to me. Maybe at the end of the day it will be. Um, so I'm kind of OK with this statement. Many people in the room might not be. Um, so, so I don't do, I, I, I don't really understand immutable um, objects. And um, yeah. And I certainly have never understood what a monad is. So. <laughs> um, again, I'm perfectly happy if uh, someone comes and talks to me at lunchtime and, and finally makes me see the light. Um, OK, so I can't talk about scientific programming in Python without telling you about these libraries, and everything will be completely confusing without them. NumPy is um, kind of the basis of all scientific programming in Python. Uh, it provides n-dimensional arrays and things that you can do to them. And SciPy gives you a lot more on top of that. And then this organic thing of scikits has appeared on top of those two things for because scipy and numpy are these are now you know quite stable and, and people want to be able to experiment more quickly so that's the scikit learn and scikit image and pandas uh, is also extremely popular and depends on those two um, but it's very very unfunctional so I'm not going to talk about it um, okay so prelude this is just stuff to get the notebook to work well. You don't need to worry about it. I'll run that. OK, so um, this is how I would normally work. So this talk will focus on the whole streaming uh, aspect of, of functional programming and lazy evaluation. Um, and uh, it talks about that because I just recently discovered it. And this is the old, my old way of doing things. So I import the NumPy library. Uh, I've got some data in a, a tab-separated values file. Um, I load it. Um, I take the log of counts plus one, which is the, the common thing to do in, in biostatistics. And then I take the mean along the, um, of the mean row, essentially. Um, and so that works fine. But of course, as soon as you have a data set that is uh, too big for memory, it's just not, uh, it, it's going to fail, basically. Um, so Python has, um, some streaming constructs, and I'll demonstrate um, what I mean by that using just a simple um, version of grep. Um, so in Python, you can open a file, and that's not going to load anything in the file. That's what open file name does. Um, and then you can iterate through every line in the file. Again, it loads them one by one, and then it's 
So that's what that for loop is. Um, and then if we find the pattern, then we print it. So it's nice, very readable, and um, I can iterate through a very large file. Um, in this case, it won't be very large because I don't have time, but you've got 147 megs uh, just off of a genome sequence. Um, and if I run this, it's fast, and um, it doesn't actually use up any, hardly any uh, RAM. Um, so we can do the same thing using the yield keyword. Um, and we can take the row, the element of all the log plus one of every row, um, the, sorry, the average, uh, using this program. OK, so for every line, I've got this line to array, which gives me a NumPy array. Um, read TSV just applies that to every line in sequence. And you've got the, that yield keyword. Is there a laser pointer around? Yeah, maybe the mouse, mouse will work. Um, so I've got the mouse thing here. All right. So yeah, for every line, I'm going to yield it. And what that does is it. Um, yeah. All right. So for every, fun every line, I'm going to yield it. And then what, whoever called. Um, this function will actually get one element back. So this is the lazy evaluation um, that happens in Python. And if I run this, uh, I get the same result as before, even though you can't see it because it's truncated um, and the notebook scrolling is broken. Um, anyway, trust me, you get the same result. And this is also not going to work. Oh, maybe it does. So if I run the same thing, but now I'm going to uh, print things uh, whenever things are happening and getting yielded, um, you'll see that you do, in fact, get lazy evaluation, maybe. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Here we go. So I've defined it. Now I run it. Um, yeah, so you've got reading the first line, taking the log, adding line to the running mean, and so on. Um, so you, you never instantiate the whole sequence in memory, which is what you want to do uh, if you have a large data set. Um, but I think you can agree that that was kind of a bit big mess of code, uh, and tools um, uses functional constructs to make that a lot prettier. Uh, so it's called tools with a Z because it's an amalgamation of iter tools and func tools, but with Zs because the um, Python standard library has both iter tools and func tools, but they are woefully incomplete. Um, so Matt Rocklin wrote tools um, and uh, essentially makes those libraries uh, a lot more usable. Um, OK, so here's. The first example is the pipe function. Um, and I can take the uh, input file name, pipe it to read TSV, pipe whatever read TSV is producing to log, and pipe that to the running mean. Um, and again, that just works. So I think that's a lot more readable than uh, this line up here. Uh, so lots of nested, nested calls. Um, yeah. Um, tools also provides curried versions of functions. Uh, so if you don't know what currying means, uh, it's the ability to, for a function to be applied to part, to receive part of the arguments and return an, a new function that will um, take in the remaining arguments and, and apply the, the original function to them. Um, so in this case, you've got the map function. And if we define the log one of an array to be numpy log of the array plus one, um, then we can do for every element in the file name, open it. For every line now that's being streamed by open, um, apply line to array. And so we do map. That's the same as saying map line to array and the stream. And then map log one to the stream and then the mean. Um, and again, this works. Um, so that's another functional construct that tools gives you. Um, fn.py has a lot of um, other functional things, including immutable data structures. Um, but we're just going to use the, the nice lambda syntax, because um, the um, Python one is pretty crusty. Um, so fn has this magical object called the underscore. Uh, here we rename it x, because uh, ipython itself uses underscore to give you the result of the last cell. Um, so this will get overridden instantly. Um, so yeah. And then we can now split the, we, we don't need to write our log, log plus one, log of the array plus one. We can just map 
x plus 1 first, apply x plus 1 to every element coming out of here, and then apply the log to that. OK? Um, and tools also, again, this is one of the nice things about Python, which is that you've got first class uh, functions uh, from the get-go. Uh, and so tools provides you the ability to carry them. Uh, so if I make an array which is the curried version of NumPy array, then I now can partially apply uh, that function. Um, and this is getting a bit unwieldy, and I probably wouldn't advocate making such long pipes in general, but um, just to show that it works, um, you can pipe whatever's coming from your file. First, do the uh, stripping of the new lines at the end of the text, then split the text by spaces, then map the array, making sure that you get uh, float type. Um, and so this is where the carrying comes in. Um, yeah, then map the exploit one, map the log, and get the mean. And again, that's going to give us the same result as before. Um, so that's nice. And then down here, um, I'm just going to, again, because it's unwieldy to write that whole thing, we can use the compose function from tools to um, make that one function. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, so now uh, some real world examples, which is kind of why you would use Python, although apparently even then you shouldn't use Python. Um, but Python, the, I, I think the great advantage of Python is it's got libraries to do anything you want in it. Um, and so in this case, we're going to use scikit-learn, which has um, incremental PCA, which can take in um, small matches of your data and, and compute a PCA from that. Um, but it has a, in my opinion, rather clunky interface. So we're going to make one that uh, will actually um, take the uh, values in a stream. Um, and so this is the object um, that scikit-learn uh, provides. And then we're going to pipe the samples we're going to use this uh, partition function, which groups um, elements in a stream into tuples of a certain number of elements, in this case, uh, 50. So for all of the samples, we take batches of 50. We make arrays, 2D arrays of those. And then we uh, apply the uh, partial fit function from the IPCA object. Um, and then we're going to return that. OK. And so. I'm hoping, yeah. OK, and so I've got the iris data set, which is a common machine learning data set. Um, I'm going to open that map line to array and pipe it into the streaming PCA function. And then I'm going to pipe the same data again. Again, if this is, this is a small example data set, but if this data set never fits in your memory, then you do one pass to compute the transform, and then you do a second pass to, com to actually transform the, the data. Uh, so here, the data transformed. We map it to line to array. Um, we need to do this conversion um, because um, scikit-learn requires 2D arrays as input. Um, then we PCA transform using the PCA object we created here. And then we um, squeeze it to two dimensions. OK. And so I'm not going to, this is just display code. Um, but essentially, here's your PCA plot of iris. And if you've ever seen a PCA of iris, that's exactly what it looks like, even though we use this, the streaming um, algorithm. Um, and if we use the much bigger data set, then obviously um, that's a really nice gain. Um, another application um, from my own field of bioinformatics. Um, so camera counting is a common way of, of detecting errors in DNA sequence. Um, and the idea is sequence comes in small chunks. Um, and if you had like small chunks of English text, um, the frequency of this value to be or not to is actually going to be much, much less than to be or not to um, in English. Um, and so by finding low frequency 15 mers, we can detect transcription errors in English text. Um, so it's the same for DNA. Um, and so here we, use, we can use the sliding window, which is another curried function from tools, um, and filter wherever writing the, the um, Python built-in so that um, we can have currying. Um, so if we define this thing, this is particular to the format of the DNA comes in. Sequence names come with a um, greater than symbol. Uh, everything else is sequence. Uh, so we pipe the data, pipe it to open. Now we're getting lines of this original data set. We filter by the isSequence function. 
we strip the new lines at the end of the uh, lines. And then we apply sliding window K to each of those lines. So now we're getting two sliding windows views of, those, of that text. And we concatenate all of the sliding windows. And then instead of tuples, we want little strings. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, and then we use frequencies, which is built in again. And that's just going to count by identity how many of each element in this, um, file, um, in this stream exists. And so it actually it doesn't matter. The number of k mers of seven mers is, is bounded. So it doesn't matter how big my, my original genomic data is. Um, my frequencies dictionary is going to be quite small. Um, so if I make a histogram function of that, uh, this is, oh no, <laughs> let's see if I can fix this. Okay, good. Um, so hopefully you can see that there's a large spike at single counts here. So all of those would be our um, DNA sequencing errors um, here on the left. And these would be, the, this is the natural distribution of cameras that you find in the data. Okay, so um, with a very small program, we've been able to detect where the errors in our DNA sequence were. Okay, and so the last example is um, trying to get a Markov model from the genome. So that's the idea that uh, transitioning from one letter of DNA to another is different depending on whether you are uh, in one kind of sequence or another. Um, so it's, it would be the same in English versus French, and if you wanted to detect the language that an input text was, you might use a Markov model. Um, that's probably not the best way to do it, but you could do it that way. Um, okay, um, so again, I'm just going to, so these are the letters of the genetic alphabet. I'm exploiting a feature of uh, genomic data um, that is that it often comes with capital case for um, normal data and lowercase for repetitive sequences, which have low information content um, and so on. Um, and so these are all the letters that we can have. Um, and these are all the um, pairs of letters that we can have. And I'm arranging them in, a, in values from 0 to 7 so that I can index the Markov model uh, matrix. Um, so this is a dictionary that translates um, pairs of letters to coordinates in a 2D matrix. Um, and then I'm going to carry this function. And for a given input, um, which will be a re initially blank um, model matrix of 8 by 8, um, whenever I pass in an index, I'm going to in increment the value in that index. So now I can count how many letter pairs exist um, in my input sequence. Okay. Um, so this is just going to read a file, and then it's going to spit out nucleotides. Um, so DNA sequence at me, one character by character. And then this will take um, every pair of characters in a sequence. It's going to um, make a sliding window of size 2, get the uh, corresponding index element, and then for every uh, bit in that stream, it's going to increment the model at that value. So now I'm counting pairs using this um, construct. And then at the end of all that, I'm going to divide by the um, total uh, counts of each row, and that gives me a transition probability matrix. OK. Um, and so now I'm just going to pipe my genomic data. This is a, a small subset of it, obviously. Um, to my genome function that's going to now spit out single letters from that data. And then I'm only going to take the first million letters. And then I'm going to, um, yeah, apply the Markov function. And so at the end of that, I get a model. Um, so this is the number one problem with Python. It's going to be nice because you're not going to be able to see it. Um, <laughs> for someone who likes Python, that's good. Um, but um, the biggest thing is that Python has a significant function call overhead. Um, and that means that I can only go about half a megabyte per second if I'm processing single characters from a file. Um, if you're doing um, function calls, a function call for every character. Um, and that's a very hard cap. 
Um, but anyway, it still works, and the nice thing is that it doesn't matter how big our genome is, it'll do, it might take a long time, but it's not gonna blow up our memories. Um, and so we can print the transition probability matrix that we've got, um, and um, probably a better way to look at it is to um, plot it, okay? Um, and even in the low contrast of this monitor, you can see that the transition from G to A um, and G to C and G to G has changed between the um, repetitive sequence here and the non-repetitive sequence. Uh, so with this Markov uh, matrix, we can now be given some sequence that we don't know the answer for and determine whether it's repetitive or not repetitive. Um, That should, that should say in conclusion. <laughs> um, so there's, even though Python is not a purely functional programming language, um, there's some nice libraries and constructs that you can make it be almost functional. And with all of the nice libraries that Python has, um, that can make it a very nice experience um, programming in Python. And the other thing is if you are going to process large data sets, um, it's usually tempting to write the non-streaming version first um, and then say, I'll fix it later, but that never happens. Um, and so uh, do it right from the start or you might never get to it. <laughs> um, and that's it. Questions? Yes? Uh, yes, so the question is, yeah, uh, if I try PyPy, uh, do I solve the um, function call problem. I haven't actually tried it, and the reason is that PyPy support for NumPy and SciPy uh, is uh, limited at best, and so it's, it's too much of a sacrifice for me. If you don't depend on the scientific Python ecosystem, um, I'm, I think PyPy does solve that problem. Anything else? Okay, I think lunchtime. <laughs>